Starship Flight 10 is just hours from liftoff, and the launch pad is alive with final preparations. Packed with high-stakes upgrades, bold new objectives, and fixes forged from past failures, this mission could redefine Starship's future. Let's break it down. Launch preparations began early Thursday morning with the rollout of Booster 16 to the launch site, following a final round of system-level inspections, hardware upgrades, and the installation of flight termination system charges. Once at the pad, the booster was lifted by the tower's chopstick arms, precisely aligned, and secured onto the launch mount. Ship 37, the upper stage, is scheduled for transport to the launch site as early as Saturday evening. Once there, it will be stacked atop the booster, completing the fully integrated Starship vehicle for Flight 10. SpaceX is now targeting Flight 10 for no earlier than Sunday, August 24th, with the launch license secured, road closures scheduled, and notices to mariners and airmen already issued for the launch day and backup windows. Alongside the launch timeline, they've released the full mission profile, including the key flight objectives. Like earlier flight tests, Flight 10 will launch from Starbase Pad A on a suborbital trajectory to execute a series of mission objectives and experimental maneuvers. After a nominal ascent and stage separation, Booster 16 will flip in a controlled direction before beginning its boost back burn. This maneuver, achieved by blocking vents on the hot stage adapter to redirect the ship's exhaust, was first demonstrated on Flight 9. In earlier flights, the booster's flip direction was not controlled, but resulted from a directional push caused by small thrust imbalances in the upper stage engines at ignition. By contrast, the new controlled flip method provides a predictable attitude change, reducing the reserve propellant the ship must carry and freeing more for ascent, thereby increasing payload capacity. Because Flight 10 involves complex booster post-separation maneuvers, attempting a tower catch carries a heightened risk of failure. An anomaly during these maneuvers could cause the booster to miss the tower arms and impact near the pad, threatening ground infrastructure. To mitigate this risk, SpaceX will forego a catch attempt on Flight 10, directing the booster instead on a downrange trajectory for splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. On Flight 9, the booster descended at a steeper angle of attack, reaching about 17 degrees, which increased atmospheric drag to slow it down before the landing burn. This aerodynamic braking reduced landing burn fuel needs, but exposed more of the booster's side profile to airflow, dramatically increasing structural loads. The downcomer, the methane transfer tube inside the oxygen tank, failed under this stress, allowing methane and oxygen to mix and triggering an explosion about one kilometer above the ocean. To prevent a recurrence of this issue, SpaceX will avoid such steep descent profiles on Block 2 boosters. As a result, Flights 10 and 11 will not attempt this maneuver. From Flight 12 onward, Block 3 boosters will take over, featuring a heavily reinforced and structurally rigid downcomer designed to withstand extreme loads. This upgrade means we may see steeper angle of attack returns tested again, beginning with Flight 12. For Flight 10's landing burn, SpaceX will test an engine-out scenario. Of the three central Raptors, one will be intentionally disabled, with a backup engine from the middle ring taking over for thrust vectoring. Near splashdown, the booster will transition to two central engines, then shut down mid-air for a controlled hard splashdown. This simulates a degraded three-engine landing and validates Super Heavy's ability to survive an engine failure seconds before tower catch, improving overall reliability. Meanwhile, Ship 37 will continue its mission and target multiple in-space objectives, including the deployment of eight Starlink simulators, similar in size to next-gen Starlink satellites, serving as a critical validation test for Starship's payload deployment system. These simulators were loaded one by one into the ship's payload bay before its rollout to the launch pad. The Starlink simulators deployed will follow the same suborbital trajectory as the ship and are expected to fully burn up during re-entry. As part of mission goals, a single Raptor engine on the ship will briefly restart in microgravity to demonstrate its ability to reignite and execute a controlled deorbit burn, crucial for precise re-entry and landing on future missions. Apart from these, the flight test includes several key experiments focused on enabling the ship's safe return to the launch site in future missions after passing intense re-entry conditions. A major part of this testing involves pushing the limits of the thermal protection system. Several heat tiles on Ship 37 were deliberately left uninstalled to stress test exposed areas during re-entry and assess whether the secondary heat-resistant layer beneath them can handle the load in case of tile failure. 
SpaceX is also experimenting with multiple metallic tile alternatives on this flight. One of these prototypes features active cooling, a system that circulates coolant through internal channels to absorb and remove heat. Unlike conventional tiles that passively absorb and radiate heat, active cooling offers a path to safer re-entry at higher speeds where passive systems may not suffice. Altogether, data from the re-entry phase will be vital for improving Starship's heat shield, which has been a key challenge since early test flights. Functional catch fittings were also added along the ship's sides to evaluate their ability to endure high-speed atmospheric entry and the structural loads of a future mid-air catch. Additionally, the entire tile line received a smoothed, tapered edge to reduce hotspots observed in earlier flights, helping prevent localized overheating and structural damage. The re-entry profile is also designed to stress the rear flaps during peak dynamic pressure to test their structural limits. If all goes as planned, about 66 minutes after liftoff, Ship 37 will reignite its sea-level raptors for a landing burn, flip vertically, and target a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean, concluding the ambitious mission. SpaceX has implemented key upgrades and design modifications to Starship for Flight 10, drawing on lessons from previous flight anomalies and ground test failures, such as the Ship 36 explosion. I've already covered those failure modes and corrective measures in detail in earlier videos. You'll find the links in the description. Recently, inside the Star Factory, SpaceX's next-generation Raptor V3 engine was spotted carrying serial number 20, marking the first confirmed V3 unit delivered to Starbase. One of the most notable differences compared to the earlier Raptor V3 prototype revealed months ago is the addition of localized shielding over several previously exposed components. In earlier designs, external plumbing lines, sensor housings, flanges, and welded joints were left visible. The updated version encloses these vulnerable elements beneath fitted shrouds, protecting delicate hardware from acoustic shock, high-velocity debris, extreme thermal loads, and plume recirculation during launch and landing operations. The change is especially critical during re-entry, when engines are exposed to turbulent base flow, plasma heating, superheated exhaust gases, and aerodynamic buffeting that can quickly damage exposed fittings. With SpaceX planning to remove the current false roof-style engine bay shielding on future Block 3 vehicles, these engine-mounted protective covers will likely become the primary line of defense for sensitive hardware. With Raptor V3 production ramping up, more engines are expected to arrive at Starbase for integration into Block 3 boosters and ships, beginning with Ship 39 and Booster 18, both of which are already under construction at the production site. Now let's discuss the latest developments at Pad B, which is rapidly taking shape as a fully operational launch pad. On the launch mount, both booster quick disconnect mechanisms are in place, one for chilled liquid methane and the other for subcooled liquid oxygen. Unlike Pad A's single shared BQD, Pad B's separate units provide better thermal isolation, reduce cross-contamination risk, and simplify maintenance. Moreover, this BQD is expected to retract faster than Pad A's, protecting ports and fittings from the exhaust plume during launch, thereby extending their lifespan. Crews are now tying these BQDs into the gantry's plumbing and electrical systems, while protective hoods are being added to shield them from heat and weather. Inside the flame trench, heavy steel panels now cover the floor, built to withstand exhaust from 33 Raptor engines. Final wall segments are being installed and reinforced with concrete. Another critical system now taking shape is the water deluge system. The external water supply lines are now tied into the mount's internal distribution pipes, enabling direct water delivery to the pad. As part of bringing the deluge system online, teams recently tested Pad B's new gas generator, a methane oxygen turbine that rapidly converts cryogenic liquid nitrogen into high pressure gas, which forces water from the large horizontal tanks to the pad at very high flow rates. Unlike Pad A's static cylinder based system, this dynamic turbine setup delivers far greater force, speed, and precise control, ensuring more efficient, powerful, and evenly distributed water coverage during operations. Pad B's deluge system will consume far more water than Pad A, since it not only floods the flame diverters to absorb exhaust heat, but also sprays across the launch mount deck to dampen the punishing acoustic shockwaves during liftoff. To support this, SpaceX is boosting storage capacity, with a new tank already installed beside the existing units and more on the way. Progress is also visible on the propellant delivery side, with new storage tanks, pumps, heat exchangers, and support equipment installed to meet Pad B's operational needs. 
The pipes connecting the tank farm to the pad have already been fully installed, forming the critical link for propellant transfer. Over the past week, both the pipes and ground support equipment have undergone multiple rounds of testing. For several hours at a time, plumes of venting nitrogen were seen across the site as the propellant delivery system was purged and cooled with liquid nitrogen. This kind of cryogenic shakedown is standard practice. It checks for leaks, validates flow paths, and identifies weak spots long before the system sees real propellants. While Pad B nears readiness, one key component remains, the ship quick disconnect arm for the launch tower, currently pre-assembled at the Sanchez site. Once finished, it will be lifted onto the tower in the coming months, marking the final large hardware installation. Overall, Pad B is progressing rapidly and could be fully operational by year's end. At the production site, construction of the Gigabay rocket integration facility is progressing steadily. Excavation for the foundation is complete, and deep piles are in place. Crews are now connecting these piles with reinforced pile caps, large concrete blocks that distribute loads across groups of piles. These caps will form part of a continuous raft foundation, which once cast and cured will be topped with a reinforced ground slab. Vertical construction will then accelerate, with steel columns, beams, and cladding panels rising to form a facility to build and integrate multiple starships and boosters rapidly to meet future launch demands. A second gigabay is under construction at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility inside Kennedy Space Center, where foundation work is underway to support East Coast Starship operations from LC-39A. Meanwhile, over at LC-39A, construction of the dedicated Starship launch pad is pushing forward. Excavation of the flame trench is complete, and crews are now pouring concrete into its base. Trench wall panels have been spotted on site, staged for installation once the floor concrete cures. The sequence of work is nearly identical to what SpaceX carried out at Starbase's Pad B. After the trench is lined and reinforced, the flame diverters will be lowered into place. These diverters have already been fabricated and are currently staged outside SpaceX's horizontal integration facility at LC-39A, fully assembled and awaiting installation. On the launch tower, teams are moving into testing. Drawworks cables have been reeved, clearing the way for chopstick arm actuation tests to validate the range of motion, load capacity, and precision. Meanwhile, the launch mount at Roberts Road is still under assembly. Its primary steel structure is complete, but internal components, such as booster hold-down arms, plumbing, and electrical conduits are still being installed. With the current progress, LC-39A is expected to be ready for Starship launches no earlier than next year. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Russia has successfully launched the Bion-M No. 2 biosatellite, continuing its decades-long program to study how spaceflight affects living organisms. The mission lifted off on August 20th from the Baikonur Cosmodrome aboard a Soyuz 2.1B rocket, which placed the 6,300-kilogram spacecraft into a 380-kilometer polar orbit, where it began its new series of biological experiments. The Bion program, also known as Biocosmos, dates back to 1966 and is dedicated to space medicine and biological research. Over the years, more than a dozen Bion satellites have flown, with NASA collaborating on nine missions. These spacecrafts have carried an impressive range of organisms into orbit, including primates, rodents, turtles, amphibians, fish, geckos, snails, fruit flies, fungi, microbes, plants, and even cell cultures. Each mission investigates how microgravity and radiation affect life at the systemic, cellular, and molecular levels. The latest mission, Bion M No. 2, carries one of the most diverse payloads to date, around 75 mice, divided into control groups and genetically engineered knockout mice, over 1,500 fruit flies, plants, microbes, cell cultures, and even lunar dust simulants. Across 73 experiments, scientists will study how these organisms respond to the combined effects of microgravity and high radiation. Tiny sensors implanted under the mice's skin track physiological data, such as body temperature and heart rate, while onboard cameras capture short video clips for real-time observation by researchers. What sets this mission apart is its polar orbit, which subjects the payload to radiation levels at least 10 times higher than in previous Bion flights, a closer match to conditions astronauts will face on the Moon and Mars. The data will help researchers understand how radiation alters gene expression, cell behavior, and overall organism health, and guide the development of countermeasures, such as improved shielding, medical care, and spacecraft habitat design. 
The mission also includes experiments with lunar dust simulants, helping researchers understand how this abrasive material interacts with biological systems. These insights could directly influence the design of lunar habitats, protective coatings, and life support systems for future crewed missions. The satellite will operate in orbit for about 30 days before its return capsule parachutes into the Orenburg region of Russia, where recovery teams will retrieve it for detailed analysis. Scientists will compare the return specimens with control groups to study physiological, genetic, and behavioral changes, insights vital for safe human exploration of the moon, Mars, and beyond. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.